Hey there, it's Jason Stahl with another episode of Body Shop Business, the podcast. And I am so excited today because finally, finally, I have Rachel James on the podcast. You may know Rachel, may recognize her name from Body Shop Business as she has been writing for us for a few years now and creating wonderful content. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and to finally have a conversation and, and be chatting with you today. It's been Thank a long you. time coming. Thank you so much. And so Rachel currently is the owner of Torque Financial, a division of Northwestern Mutual. She is a financial consultant in the automotive industry. Um, but you have an interesting past that I want to talk about. You were actually a wrench, as you, as you termed it, uh, an automotive service technician for some years. And you were also a fitness model. Is that correct? <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, I started my career as a technician. I went to vocational schools and, you know, worked in the automotive arena on the shop floor, uh, eventually transferred over into auto body and into the refinish side of things, uh, into the body shop business world. And then, um, probably my late twenties, I, I really, it was always a fitness net. I always ran marathons, running fitness workouts, that kind of thing. And it became sort of this hobby of mine, but I, I did compete and do fitness competitions in my late twenties and early thirties, um, which I am retired. I don't do those anymore. It's a lot of work, yeah, I <laughs> but, can imagine. but I, learned great I learned great discipline from it. So it was you a can, fun, a fun. You can eat what you want now, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And it shows, but it's okay. No, I, you know what? Pizza, all the good things. I, I finally can have all those nice things. So tell me about, um, I assume that you love cars or uh, at least, um, you know, had a, uh, an affinity for the automotive industry. How did that start? Was that like early childhood that you did realize you liked cars or what did your dad or your grandfather uh, get you into it or? Yeah. So my dad was an airplane mechanic. Um, my grandfather worked for GE and uh, my father also worked for GE in the aviation division. And our house was always, there was always something in the garage. There was always something we were working on. My mother used to be the typist for, you know, the old car repair manuals. You used to get them and they were a book. My mother used to type them. So I think from both angles, I kind of just had this exposure to all things repaired and, and being fixed. So it, it was sort of an interesting childhood in that regard because that's what we were around. Um, and we lived relatively close to uh, an Air Force base, which pre 9-11, you could just walk right up and my dad would tour us around and go, that's an F-16 and that's an F-18 and this and that. So I have tons of pictures of me with planes with my dad. And then um, I wasn't really a good student or, or not conventionally, right? You know, textbooks when I was a teenager weren't really my cup of tea. And my friends and I went to the dragway and went to races and fix things and we're always kind of tinkering and it it my dad gave me advice as I was trying to navigate my early life about like do the thing you love and you'll never work a day in your life uh, which is sort of true right there are hard days but uh, I kind of followed that advice and I went to East Coast Aerotech uh, and got my uh, certifications in aviation maintenance and then that just sort of opened the door into Nissan and Chevy and Hyundai and, and all sorts of other paths for me so I, I love anything with a motor. I love things that are loud. I like problem solving. I think that's why I love so much what I do now is that I really enjoy being presented with a problem or, or something that needs a solution and coming up with a solution. I can relate to the bad student part, by the way. <laughs> right? <laughs> I think it's so difficult. It's so difficult to follow that um, rubric, or at least it was for me. It was very difficult and challenging you know, to learn algebra and be like, but where am I going to use this in my life? Like, <laughs> where is this practical? Yeah. So tell me about what you're doing now. You are a financial consultant to the industry and, you know, reading your articles that you've submitted, um, I didn't realize how low the financial aptitude is in this industry among technicians and whatnot. Tell me what you're doing now with this Torque Financial. 
Yeah, so at Torque Financial Group, we're really kind of focused on um, working from a top-down approach. So we work with owners kind of navigating their, you know, financial plans, their succession plan, their, how do they retain their people? How do they, you know, grow and scale their company? But we also help their employees as well. So, you know, from the painter, the prepper, the detailer, helping them understand budgeting. Because, you know, we, and we've had discussions about this through some of the articles is that for most people in our industry, and again, this is a, an assumption, there are definitely some outliers and, and some people who are just like instinctively brilliant or just have a great uh, aptitude for finance. But for most of us, including myself, they come from the shop floor. And um, I worked for PPG for eight, almost nine years before opening up the practice. And one of the real things that hit me over that time was how many questions I was getting not to do about paint or, or refinish repair or auto body repair. It was about how do I know if I made enough money on this? How do I know if this or that? So, um, you know, Jack Perna, a, a colleague of mine used to say it was a uh, money by accident that, you, you know, business owners would, would value their business based on the money in their checkbook. And it became abundantly clear to me that shops, not all shops have a firm grasp on finance. And it's kind of awkward when you're five to 10 years into business to raise your hand and say, I don't know how to read my P and L or what is a P and L or, or whatever. Um, and then the more I started to uncover, it was like, well, even my peers, didn't know, you know, on the tech level, on the management level, at the paint rep level, kind of everywhere, there was sort of this, um, I don't know the, what the word would be, but there was just sort of this absence of, of formal education around financial literacy and, and wellness. And the more I got to digging into it, I realized money is such a taboo subject. We just don't talk about it. We won't go to Christmas parties and ask our, our loved ones what's in their 401k or what they have for debt. And, and we're constantly navigating this social tide of what's okay to ask and what's not. And then when you translate that to being a business owner, business owners are, are learning through observation, through assumptions of what they think their peers are doing. And they're, they're buying a piece of equipment or, or adding on more employees because maybe it's the right thing to do, maybe it's not. They're learning through mistakes. And it, it really became sort of a passion project for me, maybe like eight years ago to really learn as much as I could and dig and dig and dig into sort of the space and how could we create a resource where shops and their people could have a comfortable place that's relatable, that's not too uncomfortable, that understands their world, that I've walked their walk, I've worked in a lot of different avenues in our industry. Um, and ask some of the questions that maybe they, they're not like willing to raise their hand at a 20 group or at a conference about. Yes. And so, so you're consulting everybody from the owner to their employees, the painter, the estimate, anybody who wants to, you know, uh, improve their financial knowledge, correct? Yeah. I, I think everybody deserves a plan. I, I'm blown away that we don't teach this in school. You know, we go through formal high school, many will go to college or, or further education. And even at the vocational level, you know, which would probably be the best arena to even start such a program, there's very few courses on how to balance a checkbook, how to start a business, what are some of the things you should know. Um, and we just don't have formal education around it. So I think unless you're blessed with parents or mentors that take you under their wing and, and are totally transparent with you and show you everything, or you're a bookworm and you read a ton of books or you do your own research, it's very easy to kind of fall into all sorts of uh, bumps in the road. Yeah. You wrote an article for us a while ago that got a lot of engagement online. Um, and it was somewhat controversial in that and it's something I never thought of. You know, we have this tech shortage problem when, when we know why and, and we know uh, it's a big, big, it's the strongest headwind in the industry that the industry is facing right now. But you said one of the problems is that it's not that, that they're, the technicians are not making enough money. They're not managing their money well enough. They're not budgeting and they're spending like crazy. Um, I'd never heard that before as a reason why technicians are leaving the industry. Can you explain a little bit more um, from your viewpoint, yeah. I, I think, you know, I think we can all think of that technician that we know that's hopped from shop to shop 
that you know is categorically always at a different location every couple months and they're getting a pay raise every time um, but what I can tell you over the last you know four years of, of working with technicians in this capacity is that many of them don't have a firm grasp on budgeting or what their budget should be or what um, what the the basic financial 101s are. And for a long time, I think, you know, in the, the 90s and early 2000s, if you were a business owner and you offered benefits, that was, you were the outlier. You were absolutely crushing it. And now with Crash and Caliber and all these MSOs and different organizations that are rising and, and offering benefits, the environment's changed. And same with independents, not to discredit them. There's some incredible uh, independent collision centers that have offered full suite benefits and they're doing all these great things. But on the majority, a lot of technicians don't have education around what these things are. And when you think of the classic technician who's maybe 45 or older, they may never have gone to college. They may never have looked at an Excel spreadsheet or PowerPoint or any of these other things. And some of these tools that are out there um, may be new to them or may not be explained. So what what we've seen is that once you can start helping someone understand their finances and get them you know, contained to live within a budget, the grass isn't so green, right? Otherwise, they're, you know, if, they're, if any one of your technicians is living check to check, not only them, but their family is going to be pushing them to go find another job because it's tight and it's uncomfortable and they're eating ramen noodles every week and, and everyone's upset about it. So um, I think it's time we start empowering our technicians to be better with their finances because if they're comfortable and they're financially you know, in a space of freedom where they can live the lifestyle that they want to, both at work and at home, they are far less likely to entertain a sign-on bonus or another shop or a different pay scale. I mean, they may still, you could still lose a technician for culture or for a uh, workplace environment or a multitude of other factors, but the, the finance piece is such an easy one. It's like, okay, just educate them, share with them what benefits you have, talk to them about saving and, and talk to them about how to manage their money so that they can then be stronger with it and, and hopefully you'll retain them. You mentioned earlier that I think you said that some of these guys are, are shy or embarrassed to talk about their lack of knowledge with finances. And you wrote an article for us, too, about how talking about it seems like talking about finances and money is taboo in this industry. Um, but with you, if a shop hires you or as a consultant, it's it's sort of a private conversation, right? It's like no one else has to know but them. And it's mm -hmm. and you, obviously you're very easy to talk to. Um, so, so talk to me a little bit about how you come in and sort of, you know, break down the barriers there and, and this taboo, you know, uh, idea that, you know, oh, we shouldn't talk about money. Well, I think, you know, I, I'm always transparent about my own journey in uh, discovering these things. So, uh, when I worked for PPG, they had this program, um, where you could go to night school and they would pay for your college education to go to night school. So I took advantage, I would work all day at PPG and then I'd go to college at night and I got my bachelor's and I took a lot of business and finance classes during that time. And it was to my earlier point, I'm not the best student. It was challenging at times to sit in my seat for four hours every night after work and look at algorithms and math and all that, you know, it was just like, whoa, this is a shift. Um, so I'm very transparent that it, it wasn't first nature for me. I have to work hard to understand all these concepts and have always. And there was times where people, you know, in the industry would talk about benchmarking or talk about terms. And I was like, Ooh, I don't know what that is. And I wouldn't raise my hand because I didn't want to look like a dope <laughs> and be embarrassed. So I know firsthand, you know, it, it takes you so much longer if you don't raise your hand and just say, Hey, I don't know what that means. So I try to be transparent in my own vulnerabilities and the areas where I'm not perfect. Right. But um, really it's about having a safe space to have a conversation and I think having a, a chance to take a minute out of your business because we all know running a body shop is so challenging. There's so many variables between making sure that the cars get delivered on time, making sure that your employees are happy, your customers are happy, that the, the right product was actually painted, right? But you didn't paint the left instead of the right or vice versa or that the part fits or there's just all these variables that go into running a really productive shop. So I think it's also just having a moment to reflect and kind of say, okay, this is where I'm at. This is how old I am. 
this is where I want my business to be in five, 10, 15 years, or do I want my family involved? Do I not? Do I have family complexity that I need to deal with or not? Um, and just having some of those conversations and having almost a, a teammate along the road to kind of bounce those ideas off of and navigate a plan. Um, many, I think, kind of shoot from the hip and are reactive to things, but it's a lot easier when you can map out a plan to say, okay, this is what I want to achieve in the next 10 years. How can I break this into bite-sized pieces so that I can achieve it all in that time frame? Because you can't do it all at once. I use the analogy all the time about like working out. You know, we can all go to the, and I, I use it with my old fitness days, right? But you can go to the gym and, and try to lose as much as you want, but you can't do it in a day. You could go on the elliptical for 10 hours, but all you're going to do is burn yourself out and be exhausted. And you're going to have the same pant size the next day when you wake up. So it really comes down to the discipline of being committed to small, continuous, you know, movements toward improvement. You've been doing this for a while now, this financial consulting. Tell me... Um... Give me a, one piece of feedback or a story you have from a client that, you know, got it, you know, that that understood what you were saying and applied what you were saying. And, and maybe it's a feel good story about how they've turned things around financially. Yeah, I, I think there's there's so many stories um, of amazing growth. I, you know, I, I'll think of some recent ones, but I mean, I a couple that I, I came to know. Um, they were the family, like the, the next generation leading up to the buyout, they bought the business from their, uh, family members. And it's been really cool to watch them grow, uh, over the last two years. You know, they've successfully bought a business. They've navigated all sorts of benefits and employee retention and culture and all sorts of things. And it's been really cool to work with them through their business plan and, and all the, these dreams and, and big big future head. And then there's other shops I can think of recently. There's uh, two shop owners that they're partners and I've, I've known them from even my years before we've been working together for almost 15 years and, you know, to watch them go from a, you know, tech rep and estimator to now multi-shop MSO. And they're, they're now buying another location uh, just recently, just got another location. It's really exciting to see people fulfill their dreams and to, you know, check off those goals that we talked about before. It's like really fun to be able to celebrate some of those victories, but there's also some hardships too, where, you know, closely held family business is difficult. Um, and sometimes it's not easy. So you got to be there too on those moments where maybe it's not black and white. Maybe there's no real solution and maybe you got to really think about it. Um, so I think it's, it's fascinating though, because what I can tell you is that no shop is the same. Every single one has their own unique identity and their own unique variables to them, um, which makes it really fun and engaging to work with so many different people. Well, Rachel, you've been crushing it out there. I mean, I see on social media, uh, you're a great marketer. You're one of the top performers in your company. You're creating great content for Body Shop Business and much needed content, as we talked about, this financial consulting. How can somebody get a hold of you if they want to hire you to come in and, and you know, give a workshop at their shop. Um, yeah, I, and thank you for all those kind words. It's really cool, full circle to be on this this episode with you, but um, you can find me on the website. So if you Google Torque Financial Group, um, or our website's torquefinancialgroup.nm.com, or if you Google it and you Google my name, it all kind of pops up, but um, our number is 603-718-4363 if you want, or you can find me on any social platform, um, and stay connected. I, I love being, even if, if we're not uh, doing business together, I think it's fun just to know people. Our world's small and we all know each other through a handful of people. So it's cool just to get connected, but um, those are probably the best ways. My website or my cell phone uh, is probably the best way. And you will, you know, go to the shop, visit the shop, or can you also do virtual or is there many ways to do yeah. this? There's so many different ways to do it. And it depends on what someone wants. I mean, I, I always give kind of an introductory call just to, Hey, let's see what, what you're looking to work on. And I'm not always the best fit, right? Um, just like when you go to try and find a primary care doctor or a dentist or anyone else, I mean, I'm not for everybody. Um, so sometimes it's like, Hey, you know what, actually what you're looking for isn't my specialty. Let me get you someone else or give you some referrals that you can speak to instead. But, um, I'm always open to having an introductory call or two just to kind of figure out what, what we may be able to work on together and then go from there. 
Great. And, and again, I think it's great that you're a former automotive technician um, who has that perspective. And a lot of your friends um, that you still have probably are in that business. And so you offer a unique perspective. So again, thank you for being on the podcast today. Thank you, my friend. It's so good to be here. Thanks, Rachel. I'm Jason Stahl. Thanks for watching. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to Body Shop Business, the podcast. Check out bodyshopbusiness.com for more podcasts.